Hi, I'm Danny from FCCU, and today we're going to discuss cybersecurity basics and what you can do to improve your cybersecurity for yourself, your organization, and anyone else that you serve. There are two overarching topics that we're going to cover, including the importance of cybersecurity and social engineering. Without further ado, let's dive right into the first topic. It is crucial to understand the importance of cybersecurity so that you can understand how important it is to protect your personal information and your organization's information in relation to the threat that looms and what's at stake. In the broadest terms, the goal of cybersecurity is to minimize risk while maintaining functionality. Think of maintaining functionality as being an average person in society who has a social security number assigned at birth, maintains one or more social media profiles, uses a credit card, etc. There are risks associated with each of these services, and you need to, whether you want to or not, accept these risks to participate. The only thing you can do is minimize your risk by following cybersecurity best practices, especially for things like a social security number that are assigned to you at birth and shared to more institutions than you can track at such a young age. Bottom line, there's no way to completely eliminate risk. We're just in the business of minimizing it to the best of our ability. Here we have a purposefully chaotic figure to demonstrate the vast amount of information that can be used to identify you. The pieces of information with an asterisk by them are considered PII, or personally identifiable information. PII is any information that can be used to distinguish one person from another and can be used for de-anonymizing previously anonymous data. PII is the information that organizations spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to protect because if that information were compromised, a lot of harm could be done in the form of identity theft, fraud, and more. Next, we have a quick activity. So you can either grab your wallet or purse or just think about what you have in it. For each item on this list that you have in your wallet or purse, give yourself a point. I'll put up 10 seconds on the clock and feel free to pause the video if you find that you need more time than that. Time's up! So there's no concrete score that I would consider too risky. However, there are some items on this list that do pose more significant risks than others. Remember that the goal of cybersecurity is to minimize risk while maintaining functionality. So you need to determine what kind of risk and how much you are willing to accept. The items in green should never be carried in your wallet or purse, and the items in gray can be carried with caution, but are better left at home. Let's briefly go over each item. Social security card. It's risky to keep this on you because it's difficult to get a replacement and it can be easily used to steal your identity. Password cheat sheet. If someone were to steal your wallet or purse, they would have both your valuable physical items and access to your important online accounts. Spare keys. You shouldn't keep your spare keys with your regular keys because if you lost your wallet or purse, you're out of luck. However, keeping this with you isn't as risky as the items in green. Checkbook. Check fraud is rampant and each additional check that you keep with you poses an additional amount of risk. If you don't use checks often, leave your checkbook at home and bring individual checks with you if needed. Gift cards. Gift cards are the equivalent of cash, so there's no additional form of identification needed to spend a gift card, so losing it's like losing a lot of cash. Two plus credit cards. Credit cards are as valuable as their credit limit. If you have multiple credit cards, each with a high credit limit, a criminal will have a lot of money to spend if they stole your wallet or purse. Minimize the number of credit cards you keep with you on a daily basis and only bring certain ones if you find that you might need them. Birth certificate. Similar to your social security card, your birth certificate is a valuable document that can be used to steal your identity. Leave it at home if possible. Receipts. Some receipts contain more information than others. Be aware that any information can be used in an identity theft attempt and minimizing receipts is an extra protection measure that you can take. Lastly, we have Medicare cards. Older Medicare cards list your social security number on them, which makes it a risky card to keep with you, hence why it's in green. But newer Medicare cards don't list social security number, so the risk is significantly less, more so in the gray category. So you may be wondering, why are we focusing so heavily on physical items when this is a cybersecurity basics presentation? Valid question. Well, your personal information is more likely to be stolen than your wallet. It's incredibly important to take the same care, if not more, to protect your personal information as you already do to protect your physical items. So why do cyber criminals go to such lengths to steal our information and or breach our systems? Firstly, some cyber attacks include a string of deception 
to obtain personal information. They use newly obtained personal information to gather even more personal information and so on and so forth. Ultimately, gathering information leads to a cyber criminal destroying a system and or earning money through one, selling information on the dark web or two, using the information to conduct identity theft for profit. Here's a trivia question that you can pull out next time you're at a fancy dinner party, if parties ever happen again. The full name, social security number, and birth date of a person with a high credit score can sell for $60 to $80 on the black market. For how much does the information of a person with an average credit score sell? 10 seconds on the clock. Time's up! The full name, social security number, and birth date of a person with an average credit score can sell for as little as $1 per person or 10 cents when bought in bulk. If you'd like to learn more about how prices of information are determined on the dark web, check out the link in the description. So let's dive right into our second topic, social engineering. Social engineering is the manipulation of someone to gain confidential information. Social engineering can come in many forms, and today we will be discussing spoofing, Phishing, spear phishing, vishing, smishing, and impersonation. I promise these are all real words and real concepts. Check out our Tech Tip Tuesday playlist for more videos on important cybersecurity topics like farming, ransomware, and more. Spoofing is when someone or something pretends to be something else in an attempt to gain confidence, get access to a system, steal data, steal money, or spread malware. Spoofing is a broad concept that can be applied to a variety of cyber crimes. Email spoofing is the creation of an email message with a forged sender address. The cyber criminal manipulates the email to appear to be coming from a legitimate person or organization. Website spoofing can appear in many forms, such as one, a fake website that looks identical to a real website, often prompting you to enter personal information or make a purchase. Two, a website like number one, but its URL is almost identical to the real website's URL, but not quite. And three, a script that forwards you to an identical fake website when you've navigated to the real website's URL directly. If you'd like to learn more about this, check out my farming video for more information and examples. Caller ID spoofing is when a caller deliberately falsifies the information transmitted to your caller ID display to disguise their identity. Of all the types of spoofing, I would guess that you've probably encountered this one the most. I often get calls from my area code, but when I pick it up, the person on the other line doesn't sound like they're from southeastern Wisconsin. Hmm. Text message spoofing is when someone deliberately falsifies the information transmitted to your sender ID display to disguise their identity. This one is very similar to caller ID spoofing. A man in the middle attack is where an attacker secretly relays and possibly alters the communication between two parties who believe they're in direct communication with each other. A common man in the middle attack is when an attacker manipulates an unencrypted Wi-Fi access point and inserts themselves in between, for example, you and the Starbucks Wi-Fi. Extension spoofing occurs when a cyber criminal disguises an executable malware file. For example, a cyber criminal could name an executable file filename.txt.exe. Since the file names are often hidden by default in Windows, the file would appear as filename.txt. And lastly, we have IP spoofing and GPS spoofing, which are similar in that they disguise or hide the location of a device or a transmission. Next, let's chat about phishing. Phishing is a cyber crime in which a target or targets are contacted by someone posing as a legitimate institution to lure individuals into providing sensitive data, often by email. Phishing is both a broad concept and it can be used to specify email phishing in particular. So types of phishing would include vishing and smishing and email phishing, but you can call email phishing just phishing as well. I've listed some common sentiments encountered in most phishing emails here, such as something appearing to be too good to be true or a sense of urgency. Spear phishing is a slight variation on phishing. It's the act of sending an email to specific and well-researched targets, while purporting to be a trusted sender. The main difference between the two is that phishing emails are often sent to thousands of random people, which often means that the information in the email is vague and could apply to anyone. Spear phishing emails are sent to a smaller subsection of people who have something in common, such as a shared workplace, group, etc. Let's take a look at this email for some common phishing red flags. These red flags can be applied to email phishing as well as other types of phishing, including vishing and smishing, which we will talk about next. So I have this email email from our CEO, John Smith. The subject line reads, stuck in London, and the email reads, 
Hi, I'm on vacation in London and my money and passport were stolen out of my bag. Could you wire me $300 via Bank of America? They gave me a special link so it goes right into my account and I can buy a ticket home. And then there's a link. Thanks so much, this really helps me out. John. Let's take a closer look at each part of this email to determine if John really sent it and if we should proceed and wire him $300. So first, the sender. Do you recognize the sender's email address? Yes. Do you ordinarily communicate with the sender? Not often, and he usually emails me through the Allstep email, not directly. Who is the sender in relation to you? A coworker, customer, vendor. John Smith is the CEO of my workplace in this example. Does the email seem out of place for the sender? Not only would John not confide in me for something so important, but I also don't prepare wire transfers. I don't have the authority to do this transaction and John should know that. And then lastly, double check the domain of the email again. If you take a closer look, John's email address is johnsmith at fortcommunity.com with an extra M. Without looking closer, I may not have noticed that. Next, recipient. Were you CC'd on an email sent to multiple people? It appears as though I'm the only person that John emailed in this email chain. However, there could be a BCC or blind carbon copy that I'm not seeing. Do you recognize other people CC'd on this email? Not applicable here, but it's still important to check. Next, we have date and time. Was the email sent at a normal time like business hours or days? It appears that this email was sent today at 2.49 p.m., so it checks out. Was the email sent at an unusual time, like 3 a.m.? No, but this is an important thing to highlight. While there are plenty of Western Hemisphere cyber criminals, cyber criminals in the Eastern Hemisphere exist as well. So if they aren't careful enough, their email could appear as it is coming in the middle, middle of the night for us, which is obviously a huge red flag. The subject line is the cyber criminal's first attempt to get your attention. A phishing email is only as good as its attention grabbing subject line. If you never click into the email in the first place, there's nothing they can do to fool you. Is the subject relevant and related to the content of the email? Yes, stuck in London is relevant to John's email message. Is the email a reply to an email you never sent in the first place? Yes, this is a tactic that's used to grab your attention. When you see RE colon in an email, your first assumption is that the sender is replying to an existing email chain with which you have already engaged. Message. Is the sender asking you to click on a link or open an attachment to one, avoid a negative consequence, two, gain something of value, or three, so do something that seems odd or illogical? No, no, and kind of. If he was truly stuck in London, he might be desperate, but again, I'm not a great person to contact in this situation. Does the email seem out of the ordinary? Yes, very much so. Does the email contain bad grammar or spelling errors? No, but that can always be a red flag as well. Do you have an uncomfortable gut feeling about the sender's request? Always trust your gut. If you have a bad feeling, at least solicit a second person's opinion before interacting with an email. Hyperlinks. Hover your mouse over the link. Is the link to address different than the displayed link? Where's the link trying to send you? Let's actually go ahead and do this. So the displayed link is HTTPS www.makeofamerica.com. But the link to address is HTTP I can has cheeseburgers.com, which is clearly sketchy. Is the link accompanied with instructional text or no further information? The content of the email does describe the purpose of the link. However, random links are a staple for some phishing emails. Is the link a misspelling of a known website? I've included an example of what this can look like. Look at www.bankofamerica.com versus www.bankofarnerica.com. They switched the M for an R and an N. This font makes the spelling error quite apparent, but at the correct font size and style, it may be indistinguishable. Lastly, we have attachments. So were you expecting an attachment from the sender? No, but I do see that there's an attachment titled wiringinstructions.txt. Remember what we said about extension spoofing, where this could potentially be an executable malware file. So we're not gonna click on it. And do you normally receive attachments from the sender? Sometimes it really depends on the context. If I received an email like this at home, I would go ahead and delete it. If I received an email like this at work, I would alert my IT support of a potential phishing attempt so that they could one, verify if the email was legitimate so I could respond appropriately, two, identify patterns of phishing attempts coming into the system, or three, alert the rest of the organization so that no one else engages with the email if they also received it. Next, let's talk about vishing. So vishing is a portmanteau of the words voice and phishing. Vishing is the telephone equivalent of phishing. 
Vishing can come in a variety of flavors, which include travel packages, credit cards and loans, investment opportunities, extended car warranties, charitable causes, foreign lotteries, free trials, government agencies like the IRS, and many, many more. If you receive a phone call that you suspect is phishing, but want to verify just in case, politely describe to the caller that you would like to verify their identity off the phone before disclosing any information. Hang up the call and then research that person or organization online or any other reputable source and call back the phone number listed there. Do not use resources provided by the caller to verify their identity because they could be feeding you bad information. Next, let's chat about smishing, which is a portmanteau of the words SMS and phishing. Smishing is the text message equivalent of phishing. There's not a whole lot to be said beyond the common red flags for both phishing and phishing, so let's take a look at some examples that I have actually received. You have just received $120 from Amazon. Seriously, take one minute to answer a few questions and redeem here. See for yourself.xyz. Using the questions that we asked ourselves during the extended phishing example, I noticed the following red flags. So one, I do not have this sender's phone number in my phone. My phone is actually asking me if I should add them as a new contact or report them as spam. So. Yay, my phone's operating system for making me think about that. Two, this seems way too good to be true. Three, there's a link and I'm not going to click on it because phones are just mini computers and thus can still be infected with malware. Next, we have my favorite smishing example of all times. So, Lazad Wax, I'm Amisha22, live in your street. Cue for a friend in the neighborhood. Therefore, I have a picture on here. AlinaLiveCam.club. Join and search me, Amisha21. You also got my contact number there if you want to give me a call. I guess if you're attracted to me. So I would consider this entire text a giant red flag, but let's look at the red flags individually. Number one, I do not have the sender's phone number in my phone. Number two, this text was sent to me and 16 other people. I do not recognize the other phone numbers included in the text chain either. Number three, the grammar is absolutely horrid. Number four, there is a link. And number five, the proposition itself is sketchy. Just don't do it. Lastly, let's take a look at impersonation, which is our in-person social engineering example. Impersonation is where the social engineer impersonates or plays the role as someone you are likely to trust or obey convincingly enough to fool you into allowing access to your office, information, or information systems. Impersonators can come in a variety of flavors and skill levels, and here are a few common examples. Repairman, meter reader, IT support, trusted third party, manager and coworker. Both manager and coworker impersonations are most successful in larger businesses, but with the right acting chops, they could be successful anywhere. Ultimately, verify the identity of anyone who may be asking about information or access to your business. You can even prepare yourself a polite script like I have. Oh, I can definitely help you in a moment. I just have to go grab something real quick. If you could take a seat, I will be right back. I suggest asking a coworker or a supervisor to verify that person's identity because Perhaps, for example, they know why that IT person came on site and that information just didn't make its way to you. Or you successfully caught someone who had malintent against your business. At the end of the day, humans are the weakest link when it comes to any cybersecurity program. It's natural for them to make mistakes from negligence to social desirability. Here's what you should do if you think you've fallen victim. If the potential attack was technical in nature, like a malware program, Unplug the computer from the network immediately by squeezing the ethernet cable attached to the wall and pulling it out. If you're on a wireless device, shut down the device immediately. Contact your organization's IT support immediately and they can assist you from there. If you suspect your information is being stolen, you will need to contact several institutions. Ultimately, I would first check out the FTC's website because they have a comprehensive list of who you should contact. And that's what I would consider the basics of cybersecurity. This is by no means an extensive look at cybersecurity, but it is is a good head start to help you understand how to protect yourself, your business, and anyone else whom you may serve. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you later.